प्लीज गो एट सर वी आर लाइव नाउ कैन यू गिव मी एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू शो माय प्रेजेंटेशन अमित सर यू आर प्रेजेंटर Now, okay, sir. I can share it here. Okay, I got it. Got it. Am my slide visible? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. Visible. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bidhu Chakravarti. I am a director in the mining and metals practice of KPMG. Yes. Am I audible? Hello. Yes, you are audible. Okay. So, I am a director in the mining and metals practice of KPMG, an advisory firm. Uh, so. i look at this particular uh, topic of bits and minerals or heavy metal bits and as someone call it calls it um, as uh, from the consultant's perspective i have been uh, closely uh, following this particular area for the last few years and have keen interest um, and a few questions as well uh, that why this particular industry so to say in india hasn't really picked the pace as compared to some of the geographies where uh, reserves have already been identified and what more we can do so i really congratulate osochem for uh, you know taking up this topic on value addition of bits and minerals uh, we have one hour to discuss on this particular topic as i understand and we have the learned experts from the industry from iriel and others Uh, my role is to moderate the discussion uh, over the next one hour, but I just thought, uh, you know, before uh, asking the real experts to come in and provide their views, maybe I can put together a few slides to set the context uh, for the larger audience, so that uh, the key exam questions can uh, come out of that, and we'll build further uh, on that uh, list of questions as we go along during the discussion. uh hmbs or heavy mineral big sand we know the key six key components are ilmenite and rutile which are essentially the uh, ti ores or titanium ores then zircon garnet sylvanite monazite if you look at this particular slide that i have put together um you can see uh, that uh, when we um, when we mine the raw sand uh from the uh from mother earth and the subsequent value addition that is possible uh right from uh, pre concentrate hmbs and then you know the key minerals are produced out of that and subsequently the downstream if you look at the upgraded products like titanium slag and synthetic rutile that can be produced out of ilmenite and rutile similarly zircon chemicals and floor that can be produced from zircon the rare earths uh, which are essentially coming from monazite and then some end products like tio2 pigment uh, titanium sponge metal zircon alloys and etc are end products that we can aspire to have out of this raw sand that we are mining from the mother earth on the very right hand side uh, at a very rough estimate level if we put a value of x at the pre concentrate hmbs level um uh, based on the data that we get to see not only just in india but globally uh, that value can actually get uh, multiplied by 12 times or 18 times and up to some 30 odd times when we end uh, with the end products like pigments and sponge and metals etc what are the end uses uh, just for the larger audience uh, to be on the same page um uh, tio2 pigment etc are used in paints uh, plastics paper sponge and metals are more into aerospace defense chemicals industry zircon alloys are going to be used in refractories ceramics abrasives 
and we know about the uranium and thorium concentrate where uh, they are used in nuclear applications, batteries, coatings, etc. There are other minerals like garnet and siliminite as well, which are used in abrasive and refractory. Just moving along, um, if we concentrate only on the top three, which is aluminite, uh, uh, rutile, and zircon, uh, India is yet to achieve its full potential. And many of us uh, sitting in this panel will definitely know that. The graph only indicates that who are the key players. Uh, it is Australia in terms of uh, global reserves, percentage reserves, Australia, South Africa, and China. And uh, if you look at the global production level, uh, whereas China has been able to produce almost a similar level of the reserves that they have got, uh, but they have not been so much, um, and they have also been able to uh, produce the zircon. But if you look at the look at Australia in comparison, uh, their success rate in terms of uh, TIOs in terms of production has also not been that great as compared to the reserves we got. If we concentrate on India in particular, we have 11% of um, the TIOs, whereas the production is only around 4% of the global uh, number. And the scenario is not any better in case of zircon as compared to the reserves that we have identified uh, within India. Look, key points to note in this particular slide uh, that whereas we haven't been able to achieve our full potential so far, if you look at the global TIO2 market, uh, I'm talking about ilmenite and rutile perspective, it is currently valued at around $16 billion. I mean, talking about 2018, and it is expected to grow at a CAGR of around 9% uh, till 2025. So significant growth potential there. Uh, similarly, for TI metal, uh, it is also going to grow at 35 to 4% and is expected to reach around the market uh, uh, potential of around $5.5 billion. So as far as demand is concerned, it's going to be there. Talking about zirconium market, it's also going to grow uh, projected uh, till 2024-25 at a CAGR of 6%. Going forward, uh, if you specifically look at these three uh, minerals within India uh, and uh, look at the data of the uh, last few years, there has been a consistent growth pattern that we get to observe across the three minerals uh, in India within, within domestic demand. However, because of our, um, I would say, if I may use the term inability to uh, produce to the potential or for the value addition, um, you know, there has been uh, a trend of imports, especially for zircon, uh, a significant import that we are doing, which actually, if we can produce, you could produce to the potential we could have avoided. So, so it is time to enhance the domestic production. That's the limited point in this slide. Moving on, if you look at the overall HMBS industry in India, I think um, as far as one of the key, uh, key bottlenecks, if I may use that word, is that as far as mining of HMBS is concerned is in, is in the hands of the public sector players. So private sector investment, et cetera, is limited, has not been uh, possible. There are history and other legacy issues to that. Let's not get into the details but the current stand is where it is. And maybe because of which uh, the growth of mining has not really happened. And the, on the other hand, the subsequent value addition in the downstream has also not been uh, very, very uh, I mean, encouraging so far, okay? Across the board, uh, be it PSU or private partners. Uh, so the key intent of today's discussion is to understand the core issues behind that, uh, you know, not so successful story so far, and what are the changes that we can expect to have in the next couple of years, uh, either in the policy front or operational areas or R&D, et cetera, so that the story can be different, uh, you know, over the next few years. So the key points uh, to note in this particular slide that despite having vast resources of HMBS, India is a significant importer of TIO2 pigment. Uh, so our exchequer is getting 
impacted because of that. There is a need to enhance domestic production, I've already, and other value addition to cater to the increasing domestic demand, I've already shown in that earlier slide. Pigment and paint companies are actually relying heavily on imports, and this is actually a, a significant potential area for Indian companies uh, who can capitalize upon this uh, particular opportunity. Uh, so the key takeaways, uh, if I look at the demand supply of MBS industry in India, India has ample resources, competitive labor cost, I think developing infrastructure as well, and also growing domestic uh, markets uh, for these HMBS end products. However, it is still to emerge as a significant market player like the Australia or say South Africa or China. Point number two, uh, we haven't really focused on value addition of ilmenite and rutile uh, to process them to upgraded products like synthetic rutile or TiO2 slag, which can be finally processed to TiO2 pigment or sponge. We haven't really done that uh, in terms of scale. As far as scale is concerned, now the plants are already either uh, declared or approved, but yet to get into uh, full scale production mode. Uh, for some of the players. Third point is that we have a requirement of around 2 lakh tons of TiO2 pigment per year in India, estimated. I don't know how the number is, whether the number is absolutely current or not. Uh, but production, uh, we are having only around one fifth of that. So additional capacities need to be added quickly uh, as far as TiO2 pigment is concerned. As far as TI sponge industry in India, it is still at a very nascent stage. So if we are producing that, I think we need to uh, look for export opportunities, especially in countries like USA, Japan, and Europe. Talking about, so that was part of ilmenite, rutile, and zircon. But if you look at the rare earth elements, or REE, uh, which is essentially the scandium and yttrium, those kind of rare, rare earth elements, India has increased its production, but there is scope for import substitution. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I mean, we'll get to hear from the experts in this particular space. The key takeaways uh, for me uh, when I was looking at the data that again, India has significant global reserves. I mean, in terms of percentage terms, but production is still to achieve its potential. Especially, there is scope for uh, substitution of imports that we are doing uh, to India. Just a uh, uh, overall about the key players um, who are present in um, uh, be it the Indian players or the global players. I haven't really highlighted separately for PSU or private. If you look at uh, the presence, uh, many of them are present in mining, um, MSP or the, uh, that is there. But as we go along downstream in terms of value addition, and if you especially look at the Indian players, we haven't really invested in that particular space, be it the upgraded products or further value addition. There are certain cases of uh, having presence there, and I have highlighted them. Uh, please correct me during the discussion if any of the uh, you know uh, data or information is incorrect. It will also help us to kind of uh, get updated. But to my knowledge, uh, the presence in value addition is absolutely limited. Uh, so what can be done? And here are the questions uh, for my fellow analysts or the real industry experts. To my view, um, that there are uh, five, six specific things that we need to concentrate on. One is the point about low private investment, that who brings in the money in this sector. So we need to bring in private investment, that 74% equity must bear in case of a JV company, or the mining rights cannot be given to uh, you know private sector players. I think this is high time. This is revisited with whatever uh, you know firewalls or other things that need to be there in the act or regulations that can be incorporated. But rights uh, may have to be given to private players as well if we really want the scale to achieve, uh, especially in the near term. Second is there is huge export potential or opportunity for ilmenite and siliminite ores. Um, but uh, for that, we need, uh, I think we need an aggressive policy push uh, to promote downstream value addition. Third, 
very critical point uh, for me. We know India, uh, Indian mining, uh, um, you know, players have not really focused on R and D or innovation a lot. We they spend very very meager amount as percentage of their revenue towards uh, R and D or innovation. That's the trend uh, across major minerals, minor minerals. So uh, set aside HMBS. So I think this is uh, also an important factor to bring out uh, specialized products. Uh, two things are important. One is investments to increase investments, and second thing is also the learning from the global majors. That is very important uh, when we are entering into the space of value addition. Fourth is uh, how do I increase the domestic demand further? I think the defense, military, and the space research wings of the government like the DRDO or the ISRO or HAL, they can help uh, investors provide assured demand for TI metal and its alloys. That's possible with some kind of, uh, you know, arrangement, you know, commercial arrangement that can be put into place. I know the devils are going to be in the details, but as a, as a concept that is quite possible and maybe some other discussions might be happening, which uh, uh, everybody is not aware of. Uh, fifth point is again uh, is support from the respective state governments. I think there is lack of support for land acquisition, local contractor management, as far as sand mining is concerned. So I, it was just a thought. There is not a suggestion that whether there is a need uh, to make the respective state mining PSU a party. Uh, I know in the overall JV or whatever ecosystem. So that these things can be tackled better by that respective state PSU. Uh, last but not the least, I think we need to identify uh, new resources through new exploration and other, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, drilling. I mean, the data analysis, and so that we can expedite uh, the approval to for MSP expansion, especially in the CRZ uh, kind of areas. So with these uh, context in mind, I don't know whether these are the comprehensive list of questions. There will be, you know, other important questions that I have left out. Uh, may I please uh, now call upon uh, the experts to really throw light uh, on these uh, specific areas and beyond. Uh, so I will start uh, and the sequence that Amit and uh, Jaydev have given me. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Deep Koneru, uh, who is a member of SOCM National Council on Mines and Minerals, and also the CEO of Trimex Group. Uh, Mr. Koneru, if I may request you to kindly uh, share your thoughts on this topic, please. Uh, first of all, uh, let me start by welcoming all the dignified speakers in uh, today's panel who are from different backgrounds, uh, including leading business advisory services, marketing, technical analysts, and also from government undertakings, uh, who have been the backbone of development of all the natural resources in India. Uh, during uh, my quick uh, few words, I will also take an opportunity to highlight some of the major issues, and uh, possibly it will end uh, me being partly successful in bringing some key issues to the attention of the government of India. I will not bore you by giving an industry overview or uh, explaining the significance as uh, you have of the points, almost 80% of uh, the words wanted. I said I'm very proud of Heavy silicon garnet are used in various aerospace, in for defense, fertilizers, etc. As uh, my earlier panelists had mentioned, there is a huge potential for growth of these minerals. And uh, one of the key areas is the, the challenges which are faced in port infrastructure, availability of power and gas at globally competitive prices, abnormal delays in getting clearances. And um, though uh, 
the capital intense uh, these these are capital intensive industries uh, we are uh, exempted from the i mean we are not exempted from the factory law which again they are a mining industry industry is mining is not recognized as industry so we are again bound by the factory law which is again too complicated in the state governments the government should take actually a policy to allow of beats and mining and promote value addition of products certain percentage of the production of either private or the government psus as the rule stands right now should be uh, committed for value addition in india as it was earlier mentioned that almost about in fact the domestic consumption of titanium dioxide pigment in india is about 250000 tons that's 250000 tons and we only produce about uh, the, we have capacity for about 90000 tons of titanium dioxide pigment which is produced in kerala and little bit in tamil nadu uh, but it's only running at about 50 60% capacity coming to rare earth rare earth elements are used in modern technology devices throughout the whole uh, uh, throughout all the I mean, electronic polishers refining catalysts hybrid cars solar panels and uh, value addition of monocyte has been restricted to IRE. Maybe. Uh, but with the guidance and approval from DAE and government of India, uh, private companies should be encouraged for value addition, which is of great national importance. This industry is very capital intensive. So we need to be encouraged to recover our capital investments and further for setting up valuation facilities with assured access to adequate captive resources. Indian industry having all adverse scenarios like the difficult mineral suits, like for example, in the mineral, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the ore, okay, there is sand and there are five or six different minerals. In that, for example, you take out aluminite, aluminite is a consistent quality, but again, coming to garnet, there are three different sizes of garnet, which complicate the separation of proper marketable garnet. So the mineral suit is a little complicated. Uh, aluminite, comparatively, in terms of TiO2 content, is much lower than what you find in countries like Australia or South Africa. We are only at about 49 to 51% TiO2, which again restricts the uh, value addition chain for us. We can only use certain uh, processes for upgrading this eliminate. The fact that despite being one of the few sectors in India which allows 100% FDI, the actual inflow of foreign investment to mining sector has been very low. Further, without security of raw material source or an end allowing private entities to mine beet sand minerals or any other mineral, it would be difficult to attract foreign investment. There have been there are a lot of issues which foreign players, foreign investors, or even private companies face when they set up value addition facilities. Uh, if you depend on public sector companies, as for the government rule of tendering process, we cannot have a consistent price uh, for the life of the value addition project, which is understandable. We must actually analyze the reasons for that. Can we also hope that in the new regime where there is premium of exploiting and ease of doing business, we can gradually move to the single window clearance mechanism, which will save us enormous energy to put a better use. The heavy metals industry has a huge potential. You can almost attract, I mean, you can get, get a turnover of almost about 30,000 crores, which is much, uh, which is close to at least the iron ore, coal, copper mining in the country. We all know that mining is like an oxygen for the manufacturing industry, and the same is true for the heavy minerals also. In today's context, it is also pivotal to the idea of Make in India. To me, the biggest success of Make in India is when we gleefully mine in India. We are equipped with the raw materials to support the vision of Make in India given by the Prime Minister with the motto of zero effect on the environment and society, along with zero defect in the manufacturing sector. Heavy metal story is actually very critical to the Indian story, much like we did in the IT. We can, we can become a global hub of beets and mineral producers, including all the value-added value products, and end of the day, become a net exporter of these value-added products after fulfilling the ever-growing domestic industry.
With this, I once again thank all the speakers for participating in this webinar and the audience whoever have taken out their time from their schedules today. I would also like to welcome Mr. Gavin, uh, who has who's in a different time zone right now, but luckily since it's a webinar, he's able to join us. Uh, he is the CEO of TMI, which is a leading global independent consulting and publishing company, especially in the heavy minerals industry who has accepted our invitation and is participating in this webinar to give his global views. Thank you. Sorry, Bidjit, you covered most of my points. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Pradeep Kaleru. Uh, it was really uh, heartening to see in a very brief time you have presented the key issues. Uh, without uh, much ado, uh, may I please request Mr. Gavin Dena, who has really joined uh, uh, from a very different time zone, uh, who is a CEO of International Private Limited, to please share his thoughts on the topic of today's discussion. Uh, Mr. Gavin. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I feel honored. Uh, I normally travel to India at least once a year and because of COVID, I haven't been able to, to get to India this year, so uh, at least I can join you virtually. Um, TZMI has uh, been visiting India and been involved in work uh, assisting both uh, government and private uh, operators in India for decades. And we have also, through our work in the global industry, been uh, in forecasting future market trends, always been waiting for the time that from a consumption of the uh, products and the beneficiated products, such as the paints and the alloys and the ceramics, been waiting for India to follow China's example, uh, which we believe is, is coming. The timing, obviously, you, you can't put your finger on, but surely India is populous. It has a lot of uh, uh, natural and human resources. Uh, people are very innovative. They are driven. Um, the Make in India and a lot of uh, other initiatives that are occurring in India at the time, surely, in, in my opinion, will, dr will drive the Indian economy. And I think that we'll, we will see in coming decades that uh, India could well overtake China. Um, particularly as their relative urbanization and construction and, and development slows down as the real driver of the global economy. So with that as a background, where there's a very good chance that uh, India is going to be consuming an enormous amount, uh, you wouldn't want to, when you have the local resources available, be importing uh, paints and uh, pigments from from probably China by that stage as uh, their domestic industry has accelerated. And, uh, you know, 10 years ago, if there was pigment being produced in China, most people wondered if it, it was suitable to be used as road paint. It wasn't of the best quality. But now, fast forward, it is uh, competing in very key precious markets that the Western producers had all to themselves. So it is possible with the right policies and cooperation between government and private that uh, an industry can be developed inside India that is globally competitive. Because I don't think China has any real advantages uh, over India in terms of either people. And certainly uh, when you look at uh, where China is sourcing its raw materials, a lot of that is flowing in from other destinations. They have their hard rock titanium uh, deposits uh, that that are in in the west of the country, but those uh, by the time you've you've done that work and and transported across to the east, the east is it, it, it often a lot more sensible to be importing ilmenite from Africa or elsewhere. Um, certainly, China has also done a lot of work in terms of upgrading with synthetic rutile and smelting, uh, and whilst India certainly has uh, all of the components of an industry. Uh, because there are now smelters uh, in India, there are synthetic rutile plants, there are um, uh, uh, pigment plants. What we're seeing is it's still on a fairly small scale. And uh, I think the idea of uh, uh, redeveloping uh, the mines and then allocating some of their output to domestic uh, upgrading, I think, is a, is a good idea. 
Um, one thing I would caution is that often these development of these fairly complex technically and capital intensive downstream beneficiation takes some time. Uh, so you need to allow the, the uh, people that are exploiting your bodies to generate free cash flow to be able to fund these, uh, these developments. But there's no reason why it can't be done with some, some cooperative planning. In terms of if we focus on TI2, um, I'm predominantly on the East Coast and, and, and uh, with the exception probably of Kerala, it is a fairly low grade TI2 ilmenite as, uh, as Pretty Paniru and uh, others have mentioned. So it is really amenable to upgrading. Um, and when we have a look at uh, India's impact on the global market, uh, there is, has been a very significant change uh, from the 2015-2016 peak of just short of 450,000 tonnes per annum of, of sulphate ilmenite plus another 50, so, you know, uh, half a million uh, uh, thousand, sorry, that's TO2 units, not tonnes of ilmenite, so double that. So almost a million tonnes of ilmenite being produced in India to today about 150,000, 160,000 uh, uh, TO2 units, so you're looking at, you know, a fifth of that. So I think that's a missed opportunity that's been absolutely grabbed by a lot of projects, particularly when you look in Africa, either Chinese funded concentrate producers or alternatively um, uh, Kenmare Resources, for example, that has moved to mines and expanded. They are, they have, they have to fill that gap and we've seen uh, Ilmenite prices globally surge. Um, so certainly the global market is missing India's full production. And again, with the, the first speaker from KPMG highlighting that as a holder of vast resources of these minerals, uh, it's a relatively low exploiter, which is very good for the future. So it's a short term weakness, but long term, this could be a, a really good strength for India. So uh, I think the, the beneficiation route is, is clearly something that should be um, focused on more. And particularly as uh, the Indian economy develops, um, it would make an awful lot of sense to create jobs, replace imports, earn foreign exchange, because as I said earlier, there's no reason why India couldn't compete in the global markets. Um, and uh, all of this is, uh, is, is a real um, uh, driver for a focus on beneficiation. The uh, beneficiation routes available um, our synthetic rutile uh, manufacture, of which there is, as I said, a plant in India. Then there is uh, ilmenite smelting, and there's a number of technologies available in the world. And, and my understanding is that there are a number of players in India already considering uh, setting up some of these. It is doable. It has been done in many other countries. And it's just a case of doing it in a way that de-risks the the challenges uh, so that it's it's not uh, overly risky. My career started uh, in mineral sand with Anglo-American where we were establishing ilmenite smelters on the west coast of South Africa and we couldn't access Rio Tinto's technology so we had to go to event, uh, prevent legal action. We had to go move completely away from anything that Rio did. So instead of doing rectangular AC furnaces, we did circular DC. Uh, it had never been done in mineral sands before. We researched it uh, and proved it up at Mintec in Johannesburg and uh, built some uh, smelters, uh, one to start with and then a second. And then that technology was used on the East Coast at KZN Sands. And now Tronox is a very successful global producer. So if this can be done in South Africa, I really don't see any reason why it couldn't be done in India and India couldn't become, uh, given time and, and focus, a leading player in, in ilmenite smelting. And that is one step towards pigment manufacture because the end product is not the titania slag, it's actually really to provide feedstock for a chloride root process. And when we're talking about pigment manufacture, it's relatively straightforward and simple to put up a sulphate uh, plant or for or more sulfate capacity in India because there is some already existing and chloride would be the ultimate goal and as the Chinese have proven um, while it is somewhat complex and tightly held uh, with the right level of effort 
and entrepreneurship. Certainly you can become in a short time period a high quality competitive global producer of high grade pigments. Um, if I touch briefly on monazite, um, monazite has been a very sensitive mineral globally and many operations around the world, not only in India, uh, did produce monazite, but whilst initially being able to sell it, there was a period where it couldn't. That's all really changed in the last five years. And we're seeing the large um, global players such as Aluka, Tronox and Rio Tinto all exporting monazite to China. And while China does have a lot of internal resources of rare earths, um, there have been a number of uh, issues regarding environmental compliance and, and, and such matters. And so the ability to buy other people's monazite has uh, been very attractive to, uh, for China. And I think what uh, IRE has done to establish the ability to convert monazite and rare earths in, in India is a really good starting point. And there's no reason, again, why India couldn't compete not only to have the ability to convert its own monazite into the minerals that can drive all of these high-tech industries, and obviously for nuclear safety reasons, you would want that to, to be carefully monitored by the government, but uh, I don't think there's a risk that the minerals themselves could not be mined by private players and then uh, uh, sensibly controlled and sold to converters. Uh, because I think the future of a lot of clean energies uh, relies very heavily on rare earths. And for India to be able to have its own internal source of rare earths and not be dependent on China is probably even a stronger thematic than not relying on, on pigment because uh, I think it's going to play, you know, as the decades unfold and more and more CO2 is a focus, uh, you will see that there's, there's, there's really the demand for these materials is going to become incredibly scarce. Prices are going to go up and probably it will be used as a strategic weapon um, in terms of um, whoever's controlling these flows will, will not easily share. So yet again, a, an absolutely uh, really good way of India to become self-sufficient and then once it reaches self-sufficiency to even compete with China in the export market. Now in uh, Australia, there is very strict um, non-proliferation uh, legislation and uh, Australia, as I'm sure many of you know, exports uranium to India um, and those that export uranium have to in, go through many regulatory controls to ensure that that is sensibly used. So uh, there's no reason why I would say, and these are private producers, um, and they also, when they export certain mineral sands ores that are mon monazite containing, or even zircons that have very high uranium and thorium content, they actually have to uh, go through all of the, um, well, a lot of the regulatory hurdles that the uranium exporters have to go through. And that's just because Australia is very, very careful about what it does with nuclear materials. It wants to be blamed for being an irresponsible seller. So I think there is a template there uh, that can be referenced in terms of governments being able to control uh, minerals that are very strategically sensitive but mined by private individuals because it is possible and certainly at a port um, as, as we've seen in, in many ports uh, around the world it's very easy to detect if these minerals are being exported because simply putting a uh, scintillometer or, 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 or counter uh, on port exit, exits and entries, uh, they will very, very quickly indicate if monazite is moving through a port. So, you know, some of the doubt around has monazite flowed through a port or not can be removed uh, through currently available technology that's, that's widely implemented. Um, the, the other benefit, uh, of course, is that uh, you, you drive a lot of the research capability and uh, you would expect that within a decade there can be uh, a huge amount of not only theoretical knowledge but then practical operating knowledge built up in India, which leads to a very sustainable economy because as the economy moves uh, more downstream in terms of value adding, as, as the KPMG 
um, the presentation showed, the multiplier is enormous. And that multiplier is not just in revenue. It's also on the general capability and scientific capability of the Indian academic and technical community. Engineering companies learn to deal with, with more demanding and higher technology uh, applications. Um, there's there's operating knowledge that you don't have to talk to foreign experts. You have in inside India people with uh, operating experience that have made the mistakes and learned the hard lessons. So I, I don't see a reason why there can't be all of this downstream upgrading uh, established inside India. I don't see why there can't be both uh, government and private players. I think there's there's very uh, robust ways of ensuring that the government strategic objectives are not compromised by allowing non-government players in the space. It's all a case of just making sure that you plan for the regulations and you ensure there's effective enforcement and it'll be very difficult for people to cheat, I would say. It would be uh, something that could be well controlled by the, by the government. So in summary, um, I think that uh, downstream beneficiation is definitely something that should be pursued. I think uh, it can only be pursued with cooperation between the, the players. I'm not sure anybody can do it on themselves because it is quite a challenge. And certainly if there's anything we can do to contribute or assist, we, we, we are um, willing and able. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gavin Dana. Uh, you have actually uh, elaborated the importance of those uh, of valuation that India should get into. However, you have also uh, given a, uh, a few points of caution that how the approach should be uh, going forward. When I summarize at the end of the session, maybe I will highlight a few of them that I could note down. In the interest of time, uh, if I may now uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, Sri D. Singh, uh, who is the CMD of IREL, uh, the key PSU uh, who is into this space of HMPS. Uh, sir, uh, we are very eager to hear from you on your thoughts on how should we approach uh, to get into value addition in bigger scale. Uh, Ms. Singh, over to you, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was just looking my mic to be unmuted. So uh, now I'm uh, directly okay. okay. with you. Over to you, yeah. So, yeah, so good, good Over afternoon. To you, uh, thank you for giving this opportunity. Uh, I would be precisely on the topic that is uh, value addition for peace and mineral and uh, uh, maybe addressing the issue from slightly different angle. Uh, as such, uh, in India, when we look at uh, from the, uh, this point of view of value addition, uh, different stakeholders have different perception. And uh, is there connectivity issue? Am I am I audible? Yes, sir. You are you audible? are audible, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. You're audible. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> this uh, unfortunate, unfortunate issue with the BSM is that. Uh, the every stakeholders have a different perception, and probably in India, uh, there is a, a no platform where a uh, means a, a single uh, perception could emerge. For example, I'll just mention one thing that whenever a value addition aspect comes, it is uh, perceived that uh, the Indian value addition. Uh, value addition in India is not there. This is what a normal perception which we often see in the government uh, system. But uh, in reality, this is not correct because uh, value addition is. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm audible or not because there are some issues there. No. Sir, you are audible, sir. But we can. Okay. But we so can. Don't do anything yeah. uh, not because uh, I'm the direct connection. So uh, uh, yeah. this this is perceived that uh, value addition is perceived 
uh, we are at uh, not having value addition and this is normally perceived from the viewpoint of film light. But the real uh, situation is slightly different. Uh, I will uh, try to explain it with the help of these slides. But before that, uh, uh, some of the important points uh, with reference to DSM. Uh, the first and foremost is that DSM is a suite of uh, seven minerals, which uh, earlier the speaker has mentioned. And these seven minerals are a combination of strategic and lifestyle products. The second thing that uh, the minerals available in India, actually 95% are the other minerals like uh, iron ore, oxide, uh, coal, etc., etc. And DSM falls one among this 5% in a smaller fraction. The The uh, supply and demand, uh, if you look at uh, the global scenario, and before that, I would like to mention it that the DSM is such a sector which promotes to the international trade. Historically, it has happened like uh, there were pockets made, uh, pockets for mining, and then pockets for value addition. So, India, along with Australia and South Africa, was in the pocket of mining whereas Europe and other developed countries we are in the pocket of production. The BSM is a multi-product stream and therefore the challenges are much more with respect to the consumption of the product. I, I will just share our own history and story. I is in this field since 1950 and initially uh, only the Elmite uh, was uh, having some demand and uh, it was uh, having a captive consumption. Then uh, zircon, rutile, and other products, there was a lot of difficulty to look for the market. So over the period of time from 1960s to somewhere 90, and then thereafter, the market has picked up. And once these products fi start finding the consumption in terms of market, the economic model of BSM has improved. And then it is started looking as an attractive model. Earlier, it was it has not been a very attractive model. So therefore, when this is the situation, so value addition is becoming a essential and inevitable phenomenon as far as BSM is concerned. Going back to the history, which I have mentioned that India happens to be in the uh, mining pocket. So, uh, and uh, our international connectivity, the kind of international trade takes place slowly. Uh, this system uh, has given the way for a Chinese system where, where in China has established not only mines, but they have also established the uh, value addition units and they have proven to be successful. Because China has huge population and India is following them, then India can have a similar model and this, this is the perception uh, which have developed that we need to go into the value addition aspect. But there, there was a, I think, question from Mr. Vidyu that why it has not taken place earlier in the country. So some of the other aspects which I would like to uh, put forth are, uh, India has been, a, I think, uh, the developing economy or emerging economy from last 20 to 30 years. Earlier, our challenges were different. And these products are associated with the prosperity, the technological development, innovation, employ employment generation, and overall, the improvement in quality of life of the environment. So th these are the issues which will drive the uh, these product development based on BSM in the country. But another aspect is that this, this sector is very, very complex. Now we are talking about BSM. The complexity is there, but not to the extent which the rare earth industry has. Rare earth industry has even bigger complexity. And understanding issues, perceptions are very, very difficult. And when in the policy making level, the perception differs, then sometimes a slight deviation, 0.5 degree deviation in the path to be adopted leads to a big deviation at later stage. So these are the issues which this industry has suffered. And I will try to explain it with the help of some of the slides. Nidesh slide. Nidesh. Nidesh slide.
so unfortunately i think uh, our system is not working so i have to uh, just give, give me a minute folder leke aao so uh, basically if we look at i think it would have been better if i can show the slide but since uh, there is some uh, technological issues i will try to explain uh, and explain for men so if, if we mine around a thousand ton of uh, sand and uh, assume that uh, there are 10 there is 10% of uh, heavy mineral then a uh, total 100 ton of uh, this mineral should be available and out of them a major portion is elmite the elmite is such a uh, mineral which is economical in the form of a mineral as well uh, its uh, lifestyle product like pigment is also very very uh, lucrative so uh, therefore the, this uh, develop the whole economic model of the uh, this develops the whole economic model of the uh, uh, means uh, bsm industry then uh, the other products, when we come back to monazite, which we use for the captive consumption, even after having the capacity, we are not able to, we are not in position to produce that much monazite which is required for our plant, and slowly we are increasing our capacity. The, when the S, mineral assay in the Indian deposit in such a system that if we produce monazite of our requirement, the reform and brutal demand of the country will be met with uh, from the value addition point of view, but there will be a huge surge in the elmite production, and that surplus elmite production is basically looking for a value addition opportunity. And unless that happens, the in increasing increase in the production of the other mineral is normally restricted. So basically, the perspective or uh, the kind of thinking at the government level is such that most of the product will be consumed in the country. And after meeting the requirement uh, within the country, then uh, the export will take place. And we need to go up to the export level because without the export, the trade and the technological improvement doesn't take place. So uh, for that reason, we need to look for some value addition opportunity in case of Elmite. This is a open sector and technology is available in the earlier time in 50s and 60s uh, uh, and 70s, uh, what we have been producing in the southern uh, part of the country, that is in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, there have been value addition industry established. Um, and uh, what we have been producing, it was totally consumed in the country. But the eastern sector, there is a big post and uh, the production volumes are also bigger. This is the material, the uh, Finding the value addition avenue is not taking place in the country. There could be a, another reason because uh, prior to India, China has established a bee fitting uh, process in their coastal area, and it was easier to export from this uh, this part of country to China. It was uh, economical as well as it was remunerative. Therefore, the industry could not develop. But now, slowly, the things are happening in a different way. So probably. Uh, with this take in India, some of the investors may come forward and uh, value addition may take place. So, uh, in, in my opinion, these these have been the issue, and there is a long history behind this uh, BSM industry. Similar is the case of rareers. The rareers are considered in India as a uh, uh, means a mine mine material, but actually, basically, on the other side, when it comes, it is a value added product. And uh, this is a very, very complex process. Again, there are 17 elements. Some element may have the uh, application, some may not have. So in a multi-product stream, one need to find convention for each and every product. Without that, there is a, it's a natural uh, bottlenecking in, in improving the production process. And I feel that's the reason for this uh, uh, has uh, not been developed, but uh, uh, I am looking forward uh, with a positive intent, uh, positive intent of mind that in uh, the days to come, uh, this, this may be having a better scenario. I, I have only four slides. I think uh, now it is working. So maybe.
Jaydeep, were you saying something? No, we did. Oh, okay. Actually, I lost um, um, Mr. Sain. Can right. you hear? Let, let, let me check. Am I on? I think he has some bandwidth issue there, Vidyut. Yes, I mean, the video is uploaded. I think the voice is gone. Right. Let me check with them. Do we? Do we? Sir, I'm solving the issue, sir. Oh, I'm solving the issue. Okay. Could you wait for a few seconds? I think there's some technical issues there. Hmm? With bit of emphasis only. Okay. Okay. Fair point. It will take time. Please, you please go. Vidyut, you're based in uh, Delhi or Mumbai? I'm based out of Canada, but uh, as you know, <laughs> we keep traveling every week to different places. Okay. Yeah. The value addition numbers, uh, the I think the titanium metal and the pigment consumption, you've got, I think it's a little, little lower. Titanium, uh, titanium pigment consumption in India is much higher. Is it? Okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, that's what I said that the data could be a little outdated. And we need to update yeah. that. Yeah. Bidyut, so I think, yeah, Bidyut, I think there's some technical issue in CMD IAL office. You may let to go ahead to close the okay. session and hand over the session next to Mr. Deepak Rathor, please. Right. Thank you. Oh, okay. So if I may just take two minutes, uh, Jaydeep, just to summarize our points. Is, uh, Dr. Is Mr. Singh coming back? 
I'm not sure, but uh, uh, there's some technical issue okay. there. You may not okay. go, go, okay. go, go, no go ahead. Please. Right. Sure. So just summarize a few of the points that I could note down from uh, after hearing from the experts uh, of the industry. Um, uh, five, six points that come out. Okay. Uh, one thing is that uh, value addition, <laughs> downstream value addition of HMTS is a little complex. It is capital intensive. So it is very important that the same player is having raw material security on the upstream. Okay, mineral assets are available to them. And a particular player should actually do mining and get some cash flows going. So before they they will plan for the investments in value addition. Okay, that is one of the key points that was uh, noted. Second point is that as far as ilmenite quality is concerned, there are various grades. And if you look at the grades as compared to the uh, likes of Australia, etc., it is a poorer quality. So, of course, it makes sense to get into beneficiation and further value addition. Okay, that is the second point that I could note down. Uh, the third one is that the government must ensure opportunity is given to investors or new players uh, so that they can get their return on investment from value addition and one of ways is definitely to uh, when mineral assets are allocated to them maybe some conditionality can be imposed on them uh, you know or you know it can be that you need to get some value after mineral assets are allocated to you within a certain span of time okay Somebody also spoke about single window clearance uh, as far as uh, establishing these plants are concerned. Uh, one of the key points that Gavin mentioned is that India can actually be a very, very strong player in this particular space over the next five to ten years. India has not been successful to get into large scale production as compared to the reserves which actually could be a good data to have uh, as we go forward when, uh, you know, India can actually scale very quickly within a span of, say, four or five years and capture not only the domestic market, but also some of the export market. It will also help in job creation and other economic growth, especially when uh, the Honorable Prime Minister is having a dream of five trillion US dollar economy by 2025. Uh, Monazite, one specific point was made uh, that there are some environmental issues, etc. So technically, it makes sense to get other people's monazite and get into uh, further work. However, IRL has been successful in converting monazite to rare earths and subsequently has been able to you know map it. So which is a good uh, example and success story to quote and uh, uh, these are the few points that have been uh, articulated by the experts. Um, in the interest of time, and there is a next session uh, that is waiting to happen, uh, I would love to just uh, congratulate all the panelists for sharing their uh, the, uh, deep insights with the larger audience. Uh, we have learned a few new things today. And if I may now uh, request uh, Mr. Deepak Rathor, the Vice President, Technical Services of Trimex and uh, Private Limited, uh, take over the next session on issues and challenges in big sand metal industry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bidu. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jadeep, over to you. Mr. Rathor, please, please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Vedut and Mr. Jaydev, distinguished uh, uh, guest on the panel, P. Uh, Vidut, Chakravarti, Dr. Singh, Mr. Gavin, Mr. Koneru, Mr. Alo, Mr. Bhatt, Dr. Gopalan, and distinguished attendees and friends. And thank you, Asuchan, for providing me this opportunity uh, to attend this. And I, I see a lot of discussion happening in the first session on the value addition of uh, base and minerals, particularly with uh, titanium, alumnite, and rutile. 
I'll take little uh, uh, divert from here a little bit, and I'll go to a major issue what we're uh, fighting the world, which can contribute a value to the beast and mineral. That is the rare earth, and the rare earth source of mineral is the monazite. So I'll be giving an overview of uh, now the value addition of monazite, and what are the prospects and challenges in, in India. Jaydev, can, can I say at the presentation? Anu, please. Thipak sir, right now you are the presenter. Sorry, just give me time. Not able to connect. I be good. Hello. Hello. Yeah, can you help me in making it? It's not happening, Amit. Anu, uh, what is the issue? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir, we have given you presenter, right, sir? Deepak, sir? Yeah, now, now it's okay. But yes, yeah. sir. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. As we all know that base and minerals are the minerals which are having the high specific gravity and they are found in old base systems or the river systems. This base and mineral contains eliminate rutile, zircon, carnate and selenite, in addition to that monazite also. Out of this, titanium minerals are eliminated and rutile. If you see the base sand minerals, the total THM content, is, for example, let us say it is 15% of HM content, and when we distribute it, it contains about 30% garnet, 30% selenite, 30% eliminate, and one and two, one each about zircon and rutile, and less than 1% is monazite. In India, we have got the resources about six, 630 million tons of eliminate. 34 million tons of rutile, 33 million tons of zircon, 54 million tons of garnet, and 51 million tons of selenite. India, India hosts about 40% of the total world resources. But if you see the production wise, it is about only 9% of the total world production. India's production to reserve ratio is 0 0.0021, which is very less as compared to max of 0.275 in the world. In the present rate of uh, production in India, if we say the 2017-18 uh, figure, then the resources what we are having in eliminate, rutile, and zircon in India, which can sustain more than 2,000 years of life. In the, min in the mineral sand, uh, after the mining, when we do the separation of individual minerals, eliminate, rutile, garnet, selenite are being separated into the individual minerals, while 
the monojet reach tails, which is more than 5%, as per the ARB guidelines, all the private agencies, they store it in their plant premises. Uh, this part is already being discussed that eliminate value addition. Now, if we see the eliminate in India, we find like Odisha and uh, Andhra Pradesh has got the low grade eliminate, which is the sulfate grade. And this eliminate goes for intermediate value addition like sulfate slag and then uh, synthetic rutile, which further goes for the pigment. 90% of this eliminate is being used in the production of the pigment. Further, pigment goes for the paint industry, coating, plastic, paper, and ink industry. Rutile is further value added and it is being used as a raw material source for the titanium sponge and goes for the ultimate for the titanium metal. So this mineral titanium bearing mineral, the 5% of only is being used in the strategic metal industry, which is being used in the aerospace, chemical and defense industry. Zircon is further value added to the ceramic industry, then zircon, zirconium, chemicals, and in, also in the metal and refractory and foundry. Now, if you see in the chemical, chemical use of the zircon, which is used for the nuclear purposes, it is 14% of this to, to, of the 20%. So that is very negligible as compared to uh, uh, in this, uh, the strategic use we see. Now, as we see that monazite is one of the uh, mineral in the beast and uh, mineral suit. Now, this monazite is the only rare earth, uh, rare earth source in India we are have, having. Monazite contains about 50 to 60% of rare earth oxide. It contains 25 to 35% of phosphate and thorium about 5 to 10%. This monazite is enriched with lanthanum, cerulean, and uh, neodymium. Now, if you see the monazite resource wise, monazite uh, in India, we have the 12 million tons of monazite as compared to the entire world, that is 17 million tons. It is 71% of the total world resources we are having in India. Now, coming to the rare earth, why is it the rare earth are so important? Now, as all we know that the 15 elements of lanthanide group, scandium and vitrium are, are known as rare earth elements. They are further divided into the light rare earth and the heavy rare earth. Light rare earths are more commonly and available and easily extracted as compared to the heavies. And now the question comes, why they are called a rare? Are they really rare? No, not exactly. Rare earths are found in abundant in any, like any other mineral, even if more than 2000 ton, uh, times than the gold. Light rare earths are available more than the heavy. The, the issue here is that they are found in very low concentration and are rarely found in very economically extractable grade. What makes this rare earth element so important? It is because of their specific and unique functions that are difficult to substitute, their unique magnetic and electromagnetic properties, and it also it helps to operate uh, in the efficiency, more performance, speed, and thermal stability. Out of these 17 elements, US Department of Energy, based on their role of clean energy and in supply rates, have classified these uh, five critical rare earths. They are the neodymium, europium, terbium, diastrium, and vitrium. The total world resources, if you see, it is about 132 million tons. And in India, India hosts about 6.9 million tons of it, which is about 5.23% of total world resources, out of which China is about 35%. This rare earth has got the applications in the uh, various sectors of industries like ceramic, magnets, metallurgical alloys, phosphors, glass and polishing, catalyst, and other industries. If you see the uses of this light and heavy rare earth at the various industrial sector, for example, permanent magnet, 22% of rare earths are being used, where the light rare earth is 92% and the heavy consumption is about 8%. While the phosphorus and the ceramic industry, they use the maximum of the heavy rare earth elements. Now, the production wise, if you see in 2019, 213,000 tons of rare earth oxide production was there to the world world, while the India has produced only 3,000 tons of it, which is less than 1% of the total world production. Again, China here dominates with 84% of the total world production. As far as the demand supply gap is concerned for this rare earth, throughout the year, throughout these years, it was seen that the demand was always less than the production. However, 
after the 2008 world financial crisis, it has been seen that the rare earth demand has gone up compared to the production. So there is a lot of demand supply gap available in this sector. And this sector has always shown a growth rate of six to eight percent in all along, uh, like magnet to all other industries where the rare earth being used. The monazite in uh, monazite, it is the uh, cracking facility is only available with in India. Presently, is being done by Indian uh, Indian rare earth, the PSU. Uh, after the cracking, it is being separated like phosphate salt, uranium thorium concentrate and cerium carbonate and rare earth, rare earth oxide. This rare earth oxide is the source for further value addition of rare earth metals. Now, I'd like to uh, appraise you about what is, how much in India we are doing the value addition of the rare earth oxide and in the rare earth field where we are presently. The IRE has got the uh, minerals and facilities at Odisha, Kerala and in Tamil Nadu. Here, in, in, here they, pro, they are producing the eliminate rutile zircon and all the bits and minerals in addition to the monazite. And IRE also manufactures the rare earth chloride and thorium hydroxide from the monazite. The rare earth extraction plant at Oscom Odisha has got the facility to produce mixed rare earth chloride and trisodium phosphate. The plant has got the capacity to process 11,200 ton per annum. This Mixed rare earth chloride produced from the Odisha plant is further processed at RED Kerala. This plant has got capacity to produce at 3,600 ton per hour, and it produces lanthanum cerulean carbonate form, neodymium, praseodymium, samarium, gallium, and yttrium in the oxalate form. RED also helps in producing the strategic material for the DAE. Indian rare earth is also planning to is proposing to set up a uh, rare, earth, uh, rare earth permanent magnet plant that is samarium cobalt of three ton per annum capacity. This magnet is being used in atomic energy space and in different industry at the various sector of strategic and non-strategic application. Presently, the rare earth ma uh, magnet are being imported from basically from the China. Uh, since India is a non-signatory in the NPT, Therefore, there is a direct need for indigenous effort to produce the rare earth magnet in India. Presently, the technology to IRL is being provided by the BAR and the DMRL Hyderabad. Further, the rare earth oxide value addition is being carried out in India by the Toyota, Japanese, Japanese company. Here, they have got the tie up with Indian rare earth. So the Indian rare earth supplies the rare earth chloride to the Toyota company. This plant has got the capacity to produce 3,000 to 4,000 tons per annum, and they produce neodymium, cerium, lanthanum, and praseodymium as metals. Now, coming to the see the rare earth potential and what will be the requirement of India uh, rare earth requirement in India by 2020 2030. As we see, there is a lot of investment happening in electronic as well as in automotive sector. And if we see the by the requirement in 2030. Like for example, in the, mag in the magnets for the wind turbines, it will be for 60 gigawatt, gigawatt. for hybrid vehicles, 60 to 70 million, million vehicles, LED bulbs, which is 0.8 billion bulbs, and you can see huge sec uh, growth sector in all other sectors. Now, what are the hurdles in business and industry in India? Now, if, if we just go through the policy and uh, the reforms, what has happened in India, prior to 1998, this sector was reserved for the public sector. And since the public sector was not able to bring the investment and the technology in this sector, this sector was open up and uh, private sector. That is how all the private companies entered after 1998. In 2004, this was brought under the atomic uh, energy rules where the mineral processing, uh, mineral separation and processing facility is being monitored by AERB. In 2006, uh, government denotified uh, the recent minerals where except monazite like eliminate rutile uh, zircon were uh, uh, removed from the prescribed substances. In 2016, atomic mineral concession rule was brought in and where the uh, threshold value concept was, uh, uh, was uh, amended in there in which the 0.75% of monazite in the total heavy mineral 
if the threshold if uh, the threshold value is more than 0.75 then the private the government companies can work and below that the only private company can operate further to regulate the regulate this sector in 2018 this uh, export of base and minerals was brought under the consideration by IREL further in, 20, in 2019 the uh, atomic mineral concession rule was further amended and threshold value was uh, brought to zero and with this uh, the private company could not be able to operate in the base and mining sector now we, we can see that where India stands as far as you know, recent minerals are concerned and the rare earth is concerned in India. As we all know that India has got 30% of the total world reserves, but India produces only 9% of the total uh, heavy mineral production worldwide. Production to reserve ratio is very low, 0 0.002. Monazite, which is produced as a byproduct when we do the um, mineral separation of the basin minerals in India. We have got the 12 million tons of uh, monazite reserves as compared to world which is 71% of the total world resources. India falls in a low, low cost uh, raw material supply because the monazite is a byproduct in the base and mineral separation. India holds 5.2% of the total world rare earth reserves, but when we see the production wise, it is hardly 1.4% of the total rare earth uh, oxide produced globally. So here we want to emphasize that despite having the natural resources, India play no significant role in the production and processing of the upstream RED material. Due to the limited expertise in the downstream sector, India exports its upstream products, rare earth oxides, and imports rare earth containing intermediate products required for various applications. When in 2017, 18, when the private companies as well as the PSUs were in the production, if we, if we consider the production rate of that, India has got the potential to produce about 15,000 tons of monazite per annum, which in turn can give rare earth oxide about 9 to 10,000 tons per annum, which can create huge job creations, also foreign exchange, attract the foreign exchange. Uranium found in the monazite it, it can be a feed in the power plant, and India can become self-sufficient in the uranium. Now, when all the uh, in the RE consumers are looking for an alternate source for China, very well India can replace China in the downstream market. India has shown proven expertise in the upstream sector, but however, India has shown very limited expertise in the downstream sector and the rare earth value chain. Now, there, uh, this is what will be the suggestion to the government and the, you know, for the way forward, considering the way forward. As we know that India, monazite is the only source of the rare earth, uh, uh, rare earth mineral, which is found in the base sand minerals. And this comes under, and is a prescribed substance under the Atomic Energy Act. Classification of base sand mineral, except monazite, which is atomic mineral, under the MMDR Act, is not as per the international practices. So our recommendation will be that this may please be amended uh, for the development of base sand mineral industry and its sustainable growth. Monazite mineral available in the base sand mineral is not economically extractable unless all the associated minerals are extracted. So even if we are having the huge resources of monazite in, in monazite, and unless we extract the base sand mineral, we won't be able to utilize the uh, uh, rare earth, uh, rare earth from, from the base sand. And the, for, uh, for the basin mineral, the threshold value concept as introduced in the atomic mineral concession rules may be amended and may be followed as per the international practices. Government may follow a policy to allow the private sector participation in the basin mining, including monocyte. The policy should also encourage and allow production of rare earth minerals by private companies, thorium and uranium by government companies from monocyte. India needs to promote the downstream sector using the public factor partnership as the make, make in India as Atma Never Avian. And also, as we see that India has got very less expertise in the downstream sector, therefore, India can strengthen its ties with the countries like Japan for the exchange of knowledge and technology for upstream and downstream process of rare earth industry. With this, I conclude. Thank you.
Yeah. Now I Mr. request Mr. Bart. Mr. Bart. Yes, Dr. Bird. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I am still. Yeah. Hello. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, just just to add. Hello. Yes, sir. Hari Krishna, sir. Hello. Yes, Doctor Bert. Yes, Dr. Bhatt, we can hear you. Uh, how you? Is it okay? Hello? No, video is not coming. Video is not coming. Yeah, I think I think I'm, I'm just trying to connect it. I think it got. Mr. Mr. Atra, please invite uh, other speaker in the meanwhile, please. Dr. Gopalan, you are there? Yeah, I am there. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Bhatt is having some issue. Can we go ahead with your presentation? But I would like to have the share connection given by Dr. Amit. Uh, we are not seeing that share content. Uh, Anup sir, please give the presenter rights to Mr. Hari Krishna. Uh, Anup ji. Uh, Hari Krishna sir, go rights then. Eh? Yes sir. Uh, sir, Gopalan sir, go then, eh, rights. Yeah. Yeah, I'm waiting to share. Yes. Sir, uh, you are now you are the presenter, sir. Gopalan, sir. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Okay. Good evening to all of you. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Deeper. Uh, so, initially, for giving uh, the overview of uh, what we are going to discuss in this session. You made my job very simple because most of the information what I'm going to share or almost uh, I'm going to repeat it here. But let me put it in a different uh, perspective so that uh, we can move forward and understanding. So what I have put here is uh, the rarest critical survey, basically in the role for magnetic technology. Uh, basically, uh, 
about 30 years in the Command Magnet program, both in the DMR, Defense Medical Research Lab, as well as in Japan, and the crisis started on uh, the electric vehicle program. Based on, uh, I have started a mega project at uh, a lab, International Advanced Research Center for Photometallurgy and New Materials. Yeah. This is one of the research lab of the okay. Hello. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gobalan, go ahead, please. Okay. So this is the kind of uh, talk I have put here. Uh, I'll be talking about the spotlight for RNs. That's what the title uh, I wanted to give. The resources in India and the demand, and you had been mostly covered by Mr. Deba. Challenges. Probably I will be talking about towards management technology, especially for the electric vehicle program and applications. This is uh, uh, already shown. Uh, in fact, uh, I would like to put 18 critical elements apart from anthrum series plus scandium, yttrium, and you have also the other element which I have put here below that. So there are the 18 critical elements as uh, saying CMT, IR you told. All 18 may not be of critical, but there are yes, uh, energy related applications. This what I have put for uh, rather for green energy applications. Green gas is this what I put, catalytic converters, serial anthrum, the key elements. Then wind energy, if you look at it, and the electric vehicle, if you look at it, you need a neodymium, dysprosium, prosodymium, terbium, the key elements. And energy efficiency lamps, luminous and materials, if you look at it, ethereum, ethereum, europium, terbium, they are very critical. Medical applications, new neodymium, prosodium, dysprosium, terbium, and all. So this clearly mentions that various of the champion materials, which uh, material scientists, we cannot forget it for technology demonstrations. So it's going to be a very, very important uh, uh, breadwinner for the industries when we work on materials technology and transfer it to the industries. I'd like to put this chart. I think I made it uh, when I was, uh, when I came back from Japan, Professor Ramarao, the former Atomic Energy Commission uh, uh, regulatory board chairman, he asked to make a report on the, based on my experience in Japan, and the kind of uh, value distribution and consumption volume. And I took the information from uh, this Australia, this uh, Kingsworth uh, report. As only I looked at only for the magnets. If you look at the value distribution, magnets about 37%. The consumption volume, if you look at it, 21%. I'm going to tell that this consumption volume is going to increase tremendously because of the electric vehicle boom, which is going to take place globally as well as in India also. Uh, this chart was also shown by somebody. Dr. Mr. Deepak uh, showed this uh, uh, first uh, uh, presentation. I put it again here because I was also involved in this to look at some of the critical materials on short-term goals and uh, long-term goals, which is going to be very, very important for Indian, Indian point of view also. This uh, first left-hand side corner of the chart shows the short-term goals. The red ones are all important thing for five years, next five years. I think that when I put it to 2010, along with uh, the US team also. Europium, indium, neodymium, terbium, iterbium, Dysprosium, they are very critical. You get it five years uh, of five years. For another 15 years, if you look at it, neodymium, dysprosium, terbium, europium, ytterbium. I'm also going to talk about lithium is also important. We are ignoring that part as one of the critical elements because lithium is also going to be a critical element for electric vehicle program, lithium ion batteries. You no, know, that also is going to also be a Major issue. Uh, this was uh, shown again the relative abundance of various elements, and they usually they give numbers of the uh, various uh, strength of the abundance in terms of the numbers, various countries. Uh, yeah, are good, and uh, for the limited applications presently available for both strategic sectors and for some of the uh, niche applications, we are able to meet at this moment. Otherwise, we are exporting most of the rare earth oxides for the rest of the other for their need. <clears throat> now, why the spotlight I have put here in a different format here, China was the monopoly. 30% world, but 95% of the world market, they take care of it. 
65% it is the largest consumer of rabbits. Retail export of rabbit by 40%. It happened when I was in Japan 2010, when China, Japan, there was a political war came up. The reduction of exports is expected to continue. Now, look at this bottom table, list of supply and demand. I put year wise when I started 2010 this chart. 2012, light rarest, if you look at it, supply and demand are more or less okay. And heavy rarest also okay because the applications of vehicle with heavy rarest was not thought about that time heavily. And then slowly 2012, the heavy rarest demand for electric vehicle was uh, realized. Supply and demand, you can see the equation. Supply is less than the demand. But 2015, to 2025, if you look at this uh, uh, chart, 2025, light rarest still may be comfortable supply to demand, but heavy rarest supply is going to be less than demand, especially dysprosium supply. 15% of demand of ND which is required, supply is going to be 40 to 60%. They're going to face a critical problem of dysprosium for many of the applications, which especially for electric vehicle applications. So 2040, 2025 to 2040, we are going to face major problem of dispersion supply and its demand. And in terms of the proportionality of uh, what is being uh, there in the pie chart, comparing the distribution of those and market supply across the world, like I put here, I will not go into the details. This was also explained by uh, Mr. Deepak in a different format. Where uh, those distribution allocated mainly cerium. Uh, mountain pass in the US and uh, Bayan Obo and other places in China. Monocyte in Syrian as a thing. Also, the lanthanum is also one of the major uh, 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 element present in that. Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Orissa states, India. I think this is one uh, major uh, trump card for our uh, Indian products. Zero time. China, it's one of the things I have not put uh, dysprosium availability in this. This is again one of the important. Uh, mineral ore where we can get dysprosium. That's why China is playing a crucial role for electric vehicle program and import restrictions. And in zero time, actually I will show some of the data with the percentage of dysprosium availability. Then the rest of the other things are also there uh, where, where we can get uh, uh, the different types of uh, uh, elements. Now the Indian uh, perspective uh, in our country, if you look at it, there are the deposits in India, we have endogenic deposits. I call it as endogenic, and because this is non-conducive for exploit, uh, exploitation. Carbonates, megamatic uh, rocks, they're all found in Chota, Nagpur, Nagar, metamorphic, metosophic veins. But mostly the exogenic deposits, sources such as coastal or beach placer, inland placer, and uh, offensive placer, or offshore place, major source of ore. Okay. And we are very comfortable in uh, the from this source to get a lot of uh, rare earth oxides, especially we have yttrium oxide. We are one of the second largest supplier after China in the world. And this also shown by Mr. Debug. Monocyte is one of the major uh, key ore for us uh, to get uh, the rare earth components of all we are, we are looking for various applications. You can see this belt where. Uh, I have put uh, this country, say I want to put uh, IREL and Dr. Patra, former CMD, the slide I borrowed from them, one of the presentations. And the amount of rare earths ore availability also I have indicated here, like uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, then Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and all the things. This information is available in their IREL website also. Now the results also shown by uh, Mr. Uh, Deepak. This was data 2012. Now, I think IRL will have the much latest data about the resource available. Comfortable in terms of this, all these uh, resources. I just want to mention that Zircon and also that uh, Illuminate, which we talked about, uh, TAO2, uh, say that Illuminate TAO2 is going to play a major role for electric vehicle program. The one reason why I want to tell you is one of the anode material, lithium titanate, Li TAO4. The lithium titanate is going to be an important element for battery vehicle, electric vehicles. That is going to be from this kind of source. TAOT is important. Zircon, again, the silicate, zirconium silicates are important for solid oxygen cells, for purpose. 
So this is also a critical role that resource we have. We have, been, we have to see that how effectively we can use for such a very energy storage application, what we are looking at, energy storage, energy transformations, energy conversion applications. Of course, this data to only highlight one point, zero time, which I mentioned that if I look at gadolinium and the dysprosium, gadolinium is also important for semi dipole magnets, okay, for temperature compensated magnets for strategic applications. And the dysprosium, if you look at it, which is needed for electric vehicle program, okay, we can see 5.38% of REO basis in this. So we have to really explore of getting this critical element for electric vehicle program. I will tell you why the dispersive needed later uh, for the electric vehicle program also, simple job. One thing I want to put to the, all the people that the main challenge in rare earth is put the mining difficulties. Two charts I have put compared with iron ore. If you want to make steel making, the steps are mining, smelting, and steel making. Go to pick iron, pick iron to steel. Whereas if you take in the case of extra extraction, if you want to make a metal or metal alloy, you have to start from mining, then processing, cracking, separation, refining, and alloying. In the alloying, again, you have to have separation mechanism. Sometimes you have mixed errors also. So ore, concentrate, intermediate step, oxide, metal, and alloy. So that's the challenge I put here, comparison of the extraction process of various metals, suggesting the complex of rare earth extraction. This is where rare earth is also now working on, and it's going to be tough for each rare earth element. Sometimes, you know, some area may be, a technology will be different. Or nadium may be different with the same technology, we cannot use it. So this is going to be a crucial step, which uh, IIL is also taking steps with uh, the other uh, stakeholders in the country for making this technology available, for making the rare earth element magnets. Especially the price fluctuation suddenly started uh, when the electrical boom started. I just this 2010 data, as I mentioned, that when we started making this report, you can see the price within a few months, February to October, how it started raising it so high in dollars. I can put here. This is what happened uh, when there was a boom in the applications. Techno capabilities. This is the challenge which I have put here. It was made actually by long back by Professor Amarao and the Professor CNR Rao of some report. And I was asked to define it based on today's context. So I have put export and import, exploration and identification. What is the quantities available for export? What is the resource available for import? And capabilities from the mining, feasibility of extraction, setting up the pilot plan, setting up the full-fledged pilot plant production unit, and then recycling all the things I have put in one row. Similarly, another row I have put for heavy rarest what are the capabilities what we have. The institutes like IREL, BRC, DMRL, ARCA. In fact, this is one of the MOUs which was made. I was instrumental along with the Professor Amarao writing that what should be the kind of concept we should emerge up with the three parties, IRE, BRC, DMRL, ARCA to start from the whole, to go to the oxide, oxide to metal, metal to magnet alloy. How do we process it? What are the critical elements required for making such magnets? So this is again a challenge because heavy rare still is, yeah, yeah, yeah I will say it's a gray area still, for us still we are not yet gone into that. In Japan, when this crisis started, urban mining was started. We used to go to every lab, uh, stores room, pick out the computers and voice coil magnets and all those things. We tried to take it out and recycle it or go for same graded magnet applications. As this uh, thing, urban mining is also important for some stage or other when we need to go for uh, uh, when we are going to face a crisis. But urban mining in India is not yet started. We have to also keep in mind that we are throwing just like that. I know that when I used to work in DMR, I used to make lot of magnets for many, many other applications. Whenever we process the magnets, we used to have test samples. Test magnets also we process it. Now they're all piled up like anything, test magnets. Test magnets are all like a pellets, small pellets, send them on 15 ohm dia pellets. They're all quite useful for some of the applications in the electronic industries. So second grade applications they can go for. I call it as also urban mining, okay? And there's also a yeah, um, uh, exploration in Japan, 
started for underwater uh, exploration for that. It's very important. I got some report those days that uh, they can meet for 10 years or 15 years demand for entire global demand of the world. But I don't know whether it is true or not. But India also, I saw that some report, but we are not yet explored it. But we have to also do this exercise that to preserve our resources. I, I used to call that, Abdul Kalam used to call that energy assert. We should not leave any source what we have in yet. So India is also had to initiate, but I don't know what happened to that. So this is one important aspect. I want to highlight it also. And this uh, whole this table again shown by uh, Mr. Deebat. Only thing I just want to highlight it uh, for wind turbines. Present requirement is 12,000 megawatt of wind power capacity. We go for higher capacity, 50,000 megawatt or gigawatt capacity. You know, requirement of magnets, near the mine boron magnet, tons of magnets are required. We don't have any manufacturing unit for making such a huge numbers. Electric vehicle, hybrid electric vehicles. You need lanthanum, neodymium, prosodium, dysprosium, cerium. All these things right now we have negligent. Taken to account, we are importing the magnet directly. But uh, government mission is to go for millions of vehicles. Okay, if you are going for millions of vehicles, I'll tell you that one kg to two kg of neodymium and boron magnet is required for one EV motor. And they look at it, uh, the number of motors available in your car, there are more than 40 motors are available in your car, and you can uh, calculate the total quantity of magnets required for the vehicle alone. That means we need to have such a mega buildup of unit in the country for protection of magnets. That's what IRE is also taking a lot of steps, and we are also uh, in discussion with them, with the other stakeholders for doing such an exercise. Uh, okay, these are the applications. As I mentioned that in the electric vehicle automotive sector, it's like a cakewalk. It's a industries for magnets or real uh, money uh, spinner for them. And then the electric vehicle, as I mentioned to that, this is the PNS car, Toyota's PNS car, when I opened the project, this is a hybrid electric, uh, hybrid division system. The red ones are all the, shows the magnet, medium and boron magnet. The problem is the electric vehicle, the RPM goes very high. When the RPM increases, the magnet will lose its property. Then your motor will fail. To compensate that loss of the property, they add a dysprosium. Then you get a very good property for electric vehicle motor applications. But you can see that natural abundance compared to the native, it is less than 0.1. That's the reason that I stressed on dysprosium, and we have to work on making a good, uh, 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 what you call electric vehicle permanent magnet motor for BS motor applications. And of course, defense applications plenty, not only native and boron, Samarian cobalt, and other magnets where I was involved when I was in the DRDO or making large number of semi cobalt magnets for such applications. As I mentioned, the wind energy magnets, you can see that the quantity, what you see, the blue color and this uh, gray color, or tons of magnets put in one wind generator. And uh, I have given some numbers. It's required for hot applications. Le left particular hot applications, space applications needed. Again, these are all some strategic applications. One small uh, model I want to give here is to the forum is that when I was in Japan, Toyota was facing the major problem for uh, electric vehicle and magnet, thermal magnet motor, uh, especially the dysprosium. Then what they, they did was quickly they formed a consortium. Toyota formed a consortium with the uh, National Research Institute Industries within Japan, as well as they called Europe also in the forum. They made a group and they funded drastically, tremendously to all the institutes to come up with a solution to solve dysprosium free magnet or dysprosium less or minimum magnet for the electric vehicle. So I was also one of the key members in the group in NEMS where we had every critical meeting we used to resolve it and we made it as a 21st century, 21st century permanent magnet. We did it in 2015, but for the dysprosium free rather permanent magnet. Now the future challenge, I want to say that supply is going to be tight because the demand is going to increase tremendously. It be an issue. So the price for terbium, dysprosium, nitrium will remain strong. China, can the rarest industry be successfully controlled? We don't know. That's the impact on uh, other countries as well as other countries. I think we play a major role for this. 
Will the first of the new non-Chinese project be successfully built and commissioned in India, especially for rare earth mineral magnet? That is my dream, which I am trying to work it out for the country. To do that, building up such a technology in the country for rare earth mineral magnet, large scale protection. That's what I wanted to do. That not small scale, like a large scale or pilot plant scale protection. So with that, I think I will uh, uh, thank you, the uh, panel members and the other uh, participants and the delegates. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Gopalan. Now may I request Dr. Bhatt? <clears throat> yeah, please correct me there. Okay. Hello. Hello. Mr. Amit. Mr. Amit. Yes, sir. But sir, we are all you are audible, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you hearing? I am am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Audible, sir. Please oh, go ahead, sir. Okay. Okay, good evening. Uh, I am Dr. Hari Krishnan, but I am speaking from Trivandrum. That is called uh, National Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology, which comes under CSIR. Actually, what uh, you know, unlike other speakers who have presented uh, of uh, summary with to you know value addition, uh, critical uh, rare earth metals as well as uh, you know eliminate based uh, products. Uh, I've got something to, you know, something different to present before you. I don't have any, you know, uh, presentations here. But I can share you decades of experience in this particular national laboratory, wherein we have closely worked with the, uh, at least uh, three industries in developing a suitable technology for Indian illuminates for making it. Amit, can you check with Mr. Bird, please? One second, sir. Developed our own, you know, based on our experience with these industries. Now, for the first use to come to rotary kin, which was mainly used for making the sponge iron at you know 100 tons capacity, which was available to us at the sponge iron India Limited, Kotagoda, which was again coming under the Department of Steel and Mines. And there we have worked out uh, for about 10 days, and we have produced about 800 tons of you know metallized illuminate, and we have transported this illuminate to a pilot plant which you have set up at uh, the you know premises of Travancore Cochin Chemicals Limited at Kochi. 
Now we have processed this particular material for aeration rusting as well as a mined acid wash. And we have produced a synthetic rutile which contains about 92 to 93% TaO2, which is very much suitable for making TaO2 pigment all over the world. And it has got a lot of potential for the export as well, uh, in addition to the internal consumption. Now, okay, we have developed this technology and we have also demonstrated this technology in the pilot plant. But, uh, you know, for uh, our bad luck, you know, the company got into a lot of uh, financial trouble and being a public sector, they could not, uh, you know, find resources to start a commercial plant. And this technology, what we have developed in association with them, went into a hibernation. Now, after about uh, five to ten years, again, Now, this company came forward based on our experience with the And they are, we have produced about 200 uh, tons of metallized illuminate and we have started processing it in the pipe, which was again set up the, in the premises of that Cochin Minerals at um, Limited at Cochin. Now, metallization of about 85% um, uh, in about a campaign of about 10 days there. Now, again here, this metallized illuminate was processed at a, again, one more pilot plant, which we have, you know, facility which we have set up at uh, Tutukorin uh, in their titanium pigment plant. 
and uh, there we have done all the you know um, uh, downstream processing like aeration rusting as well as uh, mild acid wash and we have produced about 250 tons of synthetic rutile of about 93% ea wood and uh, but before saying yes to us uh, which, uh, these vv minerals they wanted to try their product with their claims and they have exported about 80 tons of uh, material to their uh, japanese counterpart claims to see whether it is suitable for their any of their bits of aluminum from their own uh, you know captive mines and here again our uh, you know collaboration effort with the industry failed now what i try to do you know what i try to convey you know to this forum is that whatever we do as far as the art is concerned ultimately it is the question of uh, you know entrepreneur you know who makes use of the local resources available Now, ultimately, these two public sectors companies which were given the permission to mine this, they are not interested in giving value to these minerals. And, uh, you know, our efforts even to collaborate with the for wind energy or maybe vehicles are to be fulfilled are we you know position to uh, you know liberalize our mining policy and uh, with mining people i think that that's the, that's where lacking and uh, i think uh, through this forum i strongly you know urge that the government of india has to do something and uh, thereby you know attract this uh, private uh, mining people come into this and uh, you know fund these programs and also thereby you know you know benefit to the kind of uh, you know that the minerals that what we require for our advanced uh, you know material application um, you know, we also have done, uh, you know, few, oh, you know, a few years of our R&D with respect to rare earth metal preparation. Because as all you know, that Dr. Gopalan also has put it, that, uh, you know, we are good in, we have established all our capabilities in terms of mining, in terms of, uh, you know, rare earth cracking, and also...
And um, because we have done it all, uh, we have prepared neodymium metal, presodium, all these lighter rare earths, all in one kg level in a batch process, which was essentially a calcium reduction process uh, used, uh, you know, with the title metal crucibles. And we have done it in vacuum induction furnaces. And this we have also supplied to DMRL. Those This is what I to share because I uh, don't have any, you know, um, prepared, uh, you know, slides for and uh, whatever I have done for the last three decades with respect to illuminate processing as far as the synthetic group is also our uh, a short um, uh, experience with the rare earth metal preparation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is over to Jaydev. Mr. Rathor, please conclude, yes. Thank you, Dr. Pert. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to just conclude uh, and summarize uh, the session one and session two, what we discussed all. Uh, as we know that India has got huge resources. There is no doubt of uh, resources availability in India. And it, it can be sustainable more than 2000 years. Now, coming to the conservation of minerals, yes, it has to be done with the scientific use and value addition. And uh, from all the discussion, it has came out that in, after 1998, private uh, private companies, when they enter into the production of these and minerals, they have done, they have added a lot of value to, to this industry. And the production also has gone up more than 150%, uh, which was done prior to uh, 1998. And in a very shorter time, private companies have shown their strength. And uh, I'm also confident that, yes, these private companies also given the opportunity, they can do miracle in the value addition industry also. And uh, there is a perception also that with the government that these minerals are used for the strategic use, strategic purpose. Uh, so from, from all the deliberations, it, it can be seen that most of this, these minerals are used in the non-strategic purpose. Uh, where the 90, 95% is used in the non-strategic purpose, only 5% is being used in the strategic purpose. So just for uh, sake of the strategic use of this mineral and the, uh, restricting the private companies from the mining of the base sand mineral is not correct. Another, another perception of the government was that the monazite, monazite uh, now also we can see that the monazite is al already a controlled activity and regulated under the Department of Ener Atomic Energy. Private companies are not allowed to mine Monazite, they are storing the monazite content. They are not allowed to crack the monazite. And even if all the uh, export activity, they need to obtain the monazite certificate and all. So what I mean to say that the monazite is already a controlled activity and there is no apprehension that the private company will be misusing or they will be exporting the monazite. Now coming to, uh, and for the sake of this, we should, uh, the government should not kill this industry. And uh, if you see the beast and minerals has been brought under the atopic minerals and the world well, if you see, there is no international practice is seen that beast and minerals are under the atomic mineral. The minerals like eliminate, rutile, garnet and silimanite, they are no longer atomic, only except monazite and uh, uh, zircon having the hafnium. They are of the atomic, atomic uh, uses. Otherwise, all other minerals are non-atomic. So bringing them and uh, classifying them under the atomic mineral is also not a good practice. Now we have seen that the rare or the monazite is the only source. 
for India for the rare earth oxide and the rare earth oxide value addition in, the, in India it is very, uh, very low as compared to the resources available and mostly presently India is exporting the raw material sources. So therefore, there is a lot of requirement that instead of exporting the raw material, raw material of a rare earth, we should go for value addition of rare earth. Now, as, as explained by uh, many speakers that the value addition of eliminate and rutile going for slag or pigment and all, they are highly captive intensive and it and uh, high fuel cost uh, in, in India, high fuel cost, power tariff, uh, then issues with the environmental like disposal of waste, infrastructure facilities and all. This project doesn't make economically feasible. So the government need to help uh, these private agencies or whoever is coming for, the, for putting up the value addition. To, to help them and subsidize this infrastructure facility so that it can be feasible in India. And, uh, and to bring the uh, FDI in, and the invest, investment in the end FDI in this sector, it is very much required that this should be subsidized, this, that all this uh, value addition facility should be uh, given the uh, raw material, secured raw material source. If the secured raw material source is there, then it can attract FDI also in this sector. So the last but one, what I would like to say that governments should look into this business and mineral uh, development of this business and mineral industry, and they should look at part of the national mineral policy of 2009 for a sustainable growth of this industry. With this, I conclude. Thank you, everyone. Jaydev, over to you. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for their time to address this uh, relevant webinar. The the points that we collect from all the speakers we collect in the form of recommendations and sent to government for their reference and review. I'm really thankful to Mr. Kuneru for his guidance for conducting this webinar and, and also to IREL for his support. Thanks to all the panelists and our moderator, Mr. Uh, Vidyut and Mr. Rathod. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.